and one only needs to read the New York Times or Washington Post or USA Today or whatever you read to find more and more reasons to be concerned about this subject. So what I thought I would do is read the first little tiny bit of the book, a couple of pages, and then to give you a, a sense of what I mean when I say that it's a story, and then we'll open this up the remaining time to um, what I wish we had much more time for, which is conversation. When I was young, I would often spend the weekend at my grandmother's house. On the way in, Friday night, she would lift me from the ground in one of her fire-smothering hugs. And on the way out, Sunday afternoon, I was again taken into the air. It wasn't until years later that I realized she was weighing me. <laughs> my grandmother survived the war barefoot, scavenging other people's inedibles, rotting potatoes, discarded scraps of meat, skins and the bits that clung to bones and pits. And so she never cared if I colored outside the lines, as long as I cut coupons along the dashes and hotel buffets. While the rest of us erected golden calves at breakfast, she would make sandwich upon sandwich to swaddle the napkins and stash in her bag for lunch. It was my grandmother who taught me that one tea bag makes as many cups of tea as your serving. <laughs> so you just have to be very, very patient and not mind iced tea. And that every part of the apple is edible. Money was not the point. Many of those coupons I clipped were for foods that she would never buy. And health wasn't the point. She would beg me to drink Coke. My grandmother never set a place for herself at family dinners, even when there was nothing more to be done. No soup bowls to be topped off, no pots to be stirred, or ovens checked. She stayed in the kitchen like a vigilant guard, a prisoner in a tower. As far as I could tell, the sustenance that she got from the food she made didn't require her to eat it. In the forests of Europe, she ate to stay alive until the next opportunity to eat to stay alive. In America, 50 years later, we ate what pleased us. Our cupboards were filled with food bought on whims, overpriced, foody food, food that we didn't need. And when the expiration date passed, we threw it away without smelling it. Eating was carefree. My grandmother made that life possible for us, but she was herself unable to shake the desperation. Food for her was not food. It was terror, dignity, gratitude, vengeance, joyfulness, humiliation, religion, history, and of course, love. As if the fruits she always offered us were picked from the destroyed branches of our family tree. About half an hour after my son was born, I went into the waiting room to tell the gathered family the good news. You said he, so it's a boy. What's his name? What does he look like? Tell us everything. I answered her questions as quickly as I could, then went to a corner and turned on my cell phone. Grandma, I said, we have a baby. Her only phone is in the kitchen. She picked up after the first ring, which meant she'd been sitting at the table waiting for the call. It was just after midnight. Had she been clipping coupons? Or preparing her chicken and carrots to freeze for someone else to eat at some future meal? I'd never once seen or heard her cry, but tears pushed through her voice as she asked, how much does it weigh? <laughs> A few days after we came home from the hospital, I sent a letter to a friend, including a photo of my son and some first impressions of fatherhood. He responded simply, everything is possible again. It was the perfect thing to write because that was exactly how it felt. We could retell our stories and make them better, more representative, more aspirational, or we could choose to tell different stories. The world itself had another chance. And I'm going to finish the reading part with a one-page story that my grandmother told me, and this, I, I took dictation, these are her words, it's a shame that I'm not an actor because if I were able to capture her accent, I think you would understand this story that much better, but it doesn't take a great leap of empathy. So, as I said, this is my grandmother. We weren't rich, but we always had enough. Thursdays, we baked bread and rolls, and they lasted the whole week. Friday, we had pancakes. On Shabbat, we always had a chicken and soup with noodles. We'd go to the butcher and ask for a little more fat. The fattiest piece was the best piece. It wasn't like now, we didn't have refrigerators, but we had milk and cheese. We didn't have every kind of vegetable, but we had enough. The things that you have here and take for granted, but we were happy. We didn't know any better, and we took what we had for granted too. Then it all changed. During the war, it was hell on earth and I had nothing. I left my family, you know, I was always running day and night because the Germans were always right behind me. If you stopped, you died. And there was never enough food. I became sicker and sicker from not eating, and I'm not just talking about being skin and bones, I had sores all over my body, and it became difficult even to move. I wasn't too good to eat from a garbage can. 
I ate the parts that others wouldn't eat. I took whatever I could find, and I ate things that I wouldn't tell you about. Even at the worst times, there were good people too. Someone taught me to tie the ends of my pants so I could fill the legs with any potatoes I was able to steal. I walked miles and miles like that because you never knew when you would be lucky again. The worst it got was near the end. A lot of people died right at the end, and I didn't know if I could make it another day. A farmer, a Russian, God bless him, he saw my condition, and he went into his house and he came out with a piece of meat for me. He saved your life, I said. Oh, I didn't eat it, she said. You didn't eat it? It was pork. I wouldn't eat pork. <laughs> why? I asked, although of course I knew why. And she said, what do you mean, why? And I said, what? Because it wasn't kosher? And she said, of course. And I said, but not even to save your life. And she said, if nothing matters, there's nothing to save. And that was really the guiding principle of this book. And I don't take the principle